Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. We'll grab this order. Is that okay? And yeah. welcome to the Sci Auditorium and welcome to Harvard. Uh, thank you all for coming. It's wonderful to see such a uh, uh, breadth of, of, of uh, uh, faces and personalities in the room. We're here to celebrate our uh, colleague Harvey Mansfield. He's here, by the way. Um, and uh, and in his um, he's in the midst of his seventh decade at Harvard. Um, and I'm sure there will be many to come. Um, before beginning um, uh, with the first panel, I want to um, start with a couple notes of thanks. Um, the first is, uh, oh, by the way, I'm Dan Carpenter. I'm the chair of the government department. That's not really necessary to know. Uh, before I begin, two, two notes of thanks. The first is to Bill Crystal, um, who uh, uh, helped organize this, um, uh, was uh, a shoulder for me to lean on um, at moments of academic insanity. More on that in a moment. <laughs> Um, and is really quite a Renaissance man. Uh, as you know, he uh, you know studied political philosophy here with Harvey. He's had a rich career as a public intellectual. I heartily recommend Conversations with Bill Crystal, which is a sort of a podcast video series. Um, uh, really uh, a man of uh, many talents. As, and as Anna reminded me last night, he's actually switched parties. So he's actually able to uh, function in multiple registers at, uh, at many times. So thank you, Bill. Uh, in all due sincerity, it was a lot of work and I appreciate it. Um, the other um, uh, really that just uh, a special thanks has to go to the ineffable Laura Donaldson, um, who's up there. You have to identify yourself. Come on, there you go. Um, let me say something for a moment about you academics. Um, uh, all of you. Undergraduates, graduate students, postdocs, professors, such petulant folk. <laughs> uh, and uh, she has had to deal with your uh, uh, various requests, you know, bottled water and lozenges and uh, things like that. So um, I'm very, very uh, appreciative. This just would not have happened without Laura. And as you may know, she also does a fantastic job administering the Center for American Political Studies, with which Harvey and the program on constitutional government have long had a very productive partnership. And I should mention here, Ryan Enos, uh, the faculty director of CAPS, who's also been remarkably supportive. So many, many thanks to Laura, Bill, Ryan, everybody. And uh, let's get underway. Uh, well, uh, uh, welcome everyone. I'm Eric Nelson. I'm one of uh, Prof Professor Mansfield's uh, colleagues in uh, the government department. Uh, it's a terrific pleasure to welcome all of you. Um, it is uh, a real uh, joy to be able to participate in this event um, uh, uh, on the career of our very dear friend, colleague, uh, teacher. Uh, and um, I am going to be uh, very brief by way of the introductions because we're on a very tight uh, schedule and we have a number of uh, uh, speakers whom we want to hear from. And then we're hoping to get to uh, uh, questions from the audience. So um, uh, they'll forgive me for introducing them very uh, briefly, uh, but we have uh, Professor James Hankins, uh, who is a professor in the history department here at Harvard. Uh, we have uh, Rita Kagansen, uh, one of our own, uh, who's returning, who is a uh, professor at the University of Houston. Uh, Cliff Orwin, uh, professor at the University of Toronto. Susan Schell, uh, professor at Boston College. And uh, Richard Tuck, uh, a, uh, uh, well, uh, a Harvard returning rock star. So uh, uh, welcome back, uh, Richard. Okay, uh, and uh, uh, Professor Hankins will lead off. All right. Thank you. Um, I'm very happy to be invited to speak at what for me is a very sad occasion, which is Harvey's retirement, uh, where Harvard loses its, its manliest faculty member. Uh, so Har Harvey is um, the opposite of Jim Hacker in the, in the uh, great British series, Yes, Prime Minister, Yes, Minister, where whenever um, the, uh, whenever his assistant wants him not to do something, he says, 
that would be courageous, minister. And Jim Hacker says, courageous? Oh, no, can't do that. Because <laughs> he knows it means real, uh, politically self-destructive. But Harvey always does the opposite. He run, he's the man who runs into the, into the fire like, like the Marines. And I always have admired that about him. Um, so uh, my experience with Harvey goes back 30 years. I didn't meet him until I got tenure. I'm not sure whether there's a reason that was cause and effect or not. But anyway, we met about 31 years ago. And I don't think I became really aware of his writings until... We went to a conference together in Colorado um, in Boulder, and Cliff Orman was, was there as well. And so I read his book, which Harvey gave me on Machiavelli's virtue. That's, I'm going to talk a few things. What, what little I'm going to say today is about the, this book, uh, which I uh, read at the time, just been re reading again. Um, so at this conference in Colorado, I discovered that Harvey was an ally of sorts because I was as we say today, everyone's an ally, right? So it was an ally uh, of Harvey in that he was opposing the current scholarship on Machiavelli, uh, which emphasized the civic Republican aspect of Machiavelli and tended to uh, sanitize Machiavelli as a figure who's just just another humanist, right? He's, we have to uh, trivialize him to be a, a late representative of the classical <laughs> classical political philosophy of Aristotle and Plato. By the way, this is being revived now. You know, there are people out there saying that, that Machiavelli is really an Aristotelian, which uh, is something that I think we would agree is, is egregiously wrong. Anyway, so... Um, so I read some of Harvey's book at that time, and I realized that he was uh, an important voice in Machiavelli studies. I think I put my glasses on. I'd be able to read my notes better. All right, good. So, uh, and then later on, we, we gave a course together, uh, and I was, I'm kind of political science adjacent over in the history department, so we gave a, a course called Republics and Republicanism, and my understanding of this was that I was to do republics and Harvey was going to do republicanism. Didn't quite work out that way. I was the historian, he was the political scientist, and I have uh, an anal retentive German philological training. Uh, and Harvey is Straussian, obviously, we thought it'd be interesting for our students to um, meet and hear different approaches. That didn't work because all of Harvey's students remain Straussians and all my students remain anal retentive German philologists. Uh, but nevertheless, I, I enjoyed the experience. Uh, and I discovered that uh, we, we agree on Machiavelli to a very large extent. Uh, we don't agree necessarily on anti-contextualism uh, uh, is one of Harvey's uh, features as a, as a theorist. You know, over in the history department, we, we refer to, re to contextualism as history. <laughs> That's what we do. <laughs> and if we want to, you know, historians, they want to know what Plato, uh, wh why want to know why Plato was saying what he was saying. They would refer to the Peloponnesian War or the death of Socrates or Plato's visits to southern Italy, where he came in contact with argumentation and, and Pythagoreanism, his experience. I mean, this is the kind of way we think in the history department. So I was unwilling to give up my contextualism. Uh, uh, but Harvey, uh, I think, has made a very good, good fist of it. And in the last couple of weeks, of course, we've realized that contextualism can be, uh, can be morally defective. Right, that it fails to see the obvious things in front of us. And this is, I think, is one of Harvey's great strengths as a Machiavelli scholar. He sees what's in front of him. And he sees that Machiavelli is not a classical political theorist. He's not Aristotle. He's not Plato. He doesn't fit into any tradition. He's saying something new. And this is a weakness of contextualism from the scholarly side is that we... Um, we contextualists often refuse to accept that there's something new. But this is something I, I have always agreed with uh, Harvey about, that Machiavelli is something new. Um, so uh, I better watch the time here. So Harvey has, um, uh, has um, uh, commented on the problem of what we call in the history, history profession, the problem of counsel. 
that Machiavelli uh, was faced with princes who are not necessarily smart and not necessarily good. The, the humanist tradition worried about princes not being good. Uh, Machiavelli worried about princes not being smart. So he has elaborated this view of Machiavelli as a, uh, as a prince behind the scenes trying to change change um, change the ideological uh, atmosphere of the time, something Harvey himself does in case we haven't noticed. And he does these in really beautiful uh, writing. I wanted to comment, I hope that someone else will comment on the writing, but I've always loved Harvey's writing. It's, it's very elegant it's, and it, he's, uh, it has this kind of incantatory quality uh, even when writing for, for the Wall Street Journal, uh, it's rather seductive and he has all these arresting phrases and, and, and paradoxical phrases which are designed to make you think. I'm just going to read one. Do I have time? Yes. You do. Okay. I'm going to read one uh, part, part of one paragraph to give the flavor of the style, which I really like. So he starts off by saying that he's following Strauss very humbly. He is following Strauss, but he's also um, less prudent than Strauss, I think, in his open criticism, in, in admitting that Machiavelli is on, on the warpath against Christianity. So um, he says, most Machiavelli scholars of our time care for neither uh, the tradition or, or justice. Um, they are not sufficiently impressed by Machiavelli's innovation, and they excuse him for his immorality. Or is the balanced phrases. They do not appreciate his innovation because following him unconsciously, they excuse his immorality, and they excuse that because they do not see how far his innovation extends. In this book, I have tried to keep both sides of the coin in view, not an easy task, since indignation blinds understanding, and understanding tends to dissipate indignation. That's really classic Harvey Mansfield prose. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and it's designed to sort of blow up normal expectations and to make, make you think. All right, so uh, Harvey claims three grounds of originality in this book. First of all, the importance of the sect, uh, which he deals with, uh, the sect uh, that, that Machiavelli himself is trying to found, and the sect of Christianity, uh, which he is trying to undermine. Uh, he talks a lot about the character of Machiavelli's political science, and he argues that it is uh, a, a militant political science, science that, it's a, that Machiavelli is a revolutionary, but it doesn't mean revolutionary in the way we academics talk about revolutionary, that we're set, start setting out new ideas. He thinks that Machiavelli is a revolutionary who's trying to change the world uh, by, by standing behind the prince, the puppet master, behind the prince. You know, Cosimo de' Medici is accused of being the puppet master of Florentine politics. So Machiavelli wants to be the pu puppet master of the Medici uh, and other, other rulers through the power of his ideas and to lead a counter-revolution against Christendom. So, and the last thing, of course, is his, his very uh, uh, pointed attacks on classical republicanism. When uh, Cliff and I and some other people in Harvey were out in Colorado, we had a confrontation between uh, Harvey and the leading, one of the leading historians of Machiavelli studies, uh, a guy named John Jamie, who's a Marxist. And he, uh, John Jamie's following in the Italian tradition of regarding Machiavelli as Gramsci and, and so forth. And so I saw there was this great debate in which I realized that Harvey knew the text of The Prince and the Discourses better than anybody I'd ever met in my life, and, and he was doing it from memory, right? And also citing the passages, um, from uh, the, the, the references from memory. And maybe because you just finished this book, but it was very impressive because uh, John and Jamie is one of the, the leading interpreters of Machiavelli among historians. So I was very impressed by that. So, uh, uh, Mark, so Harvey's position, I think, has become is prophetic in the sense that the, the field of Machiavelli studies, and Maurizio will correct me on this, but I think the field of Maurizio, stu <laughs> Maurizio <laughs> studies, <laughs> of uh, Machiavelli <laughs> studies is swinging back to, uh, to uh, Harvey's view that they're not going to try to reduce Machiavelli anymore to, to its, its context. Uh, Robert Black, who's written the best recent biography of Machiavelli, has completely overturned the, the traditional position. There is an Italian scholar named Roberto Ridolfi who's 
the most uh, famous biographer of Machiavelli in Italian. He's been translated into every language. There are 15 editions. And Rudolfi celebrates Machiavelli, an adulatory bi biography, which gets into his moral greatness and how he's really a Christian. And I, I think uh, that, that that point of view has been successfully dished. So the, the new uh, view of Machiavelli, uh, which I, I think the leaders here are Gabriele Padula and, and Robert Black, and maybe uh, Djurjevic, uh, Mark Djurjevic in, in Toronto, uh, have accepted the fact that Machiavelli is saying something new, saying something that's really uh, revolutionary. More time? No, okay. So uh, <laughs> maybe that's, maybe that's the, um, the way to end. And I was gonna say something about his, his prophetic qualities in terms of the, 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 the character of modern political science, but I will shut up, okay. Well, it goes against all my principles to cut you off, but, uh, but right. um, we, uh, uh, we have to keep mercilessly to seven right. minutes apiece. Uh, all right, so. I, I will stop. I just wanted to thank <coughs> Harvey for his manliness at, at Harvard over many, over many years. Uh, Rita. Okay, um, well, I was confident that my colleagues would discuss Harvey's major themes and works, so I wanted to draw attention to a couple of deep cuts uh, that have been particularly valuable to me in my own thinking. Um, and in particular, there are two articles that Harvey wrote uh, that I think deserve more attention than they've received for how they illuminate the origins of the modern state. Uh, these are his articles about Hobbes and the science of indirect government and Machiavelli and the impersonal state, both published in the American Political Science Review a long time ago. Uh, in the essay on the impersonal state, Harvey shows how Machiavelli's use of Stato bridges the gap between the traditional idea of the state as defined by the character of its rulers and the modern idea of the state as a kind of flexible container for territory, people, and institutions that's available to be ruled by anyone who manages to take power in it. Harvey points out that while Machiavelli does sometimes speak of the state as belonging to a prince or a people, he also speaks of it as a standalone entity waiting to be acquired by an entrepreneurial prince. Uh, he says Machiavelli's step towards the impersonality of the modern state can be seen in his impartial advice to all parties and persons to acquire when they can. And the essay on indirect government argues that Hobbes inaugurates the modern idea of representative government by consent or rather by authorization. He does this in order to defeat clerical control of public opinion and the violent conflicts that resulted from it and to replace it with control by the sovereign. Since the sovereign is only the impersonal office of the sovereign representative who represents the people, the people are really being ruled by themselves only at a slight but significant remove, which is to say indirectly. Uh, Hobbes's account of the laws of nature established that this is the only basis for government that's supportable by reason. And agreement on this point obviates the need of further public controversy over the ends of government uh, or over much of anything of public significance since it gives the sovereign control of public opinion to decide all such controversies on the people's behalf. Harvey says, it might seem that government by consent of the people rests on the political opinion of the people, but Hobbes tried to prevent this consequence. But Harvey admits Hobbes has been completely unsuccessful in keeping political controversy within the limits of his doctrine. So public opinion escaped very quickly from under the thumb of the Hobbesian sovereign. Locke already thought that a sovereign couldn't control public opinion and Rousseau upgraded public opinion to the status of the queen of the world, suggesting that it might even be more truly sovereign than the constituted sovereign. But while the Hobbesian project of restraining public opinion that Harvey described failed, the development of indirect and impersonal government succeeded wildly. Hobbes's philosophy was successful in undermining the other authorities that shaped and restrained opinion, like the clergy, the schools, and all the intermediary associations and corporations that Hobbes compared to worms in the entrails of a natural man. Uh, expelling or at least demoting the, these parasitic competing sources of public opinion would leave, Hobbes hoped, only the sovereign in control. But this very delegitimization of other sources combined with the development of an impersonal sovereign who governs directly, only strengthened and elevated the authoritative force of public opinion. So although Hobbes's government by consent was not intended to rest on the political opinions of the people, quite the opposite, it nonetheless ended up resting on public opinion in practice, or it couldn't help doing so. Uh, but even in the most impersonal and indirect state, some authorities can never be fully depersonalized nor simply dispensed with. So one such authority is pedagogical authority, the authority of teachers. 
All teachers are personal authorities to some extent, even dead ones like Hobbes and Machiavelli. Hobbes teaches his readers to appreciate the benefits of conceiving of political rule as contained in the office of the sovereign representative. But there can be no analogous office of the Hobbesian representative to replace Hobbes himself. No matter how long after Hobbes' death we happen to be born, we have to recur to Hobbes' own books to learn what he teaches. No synopsis or imitation will suffice, such as the necessarily personal nature of pedagogical authority. <laughs> So I would like to conclude with a few words about Harvey as an exerciser of political, or sorry, pedagogical authority, uh, that is, as a teacher. Uh, so even though pedagogical authority can't be depersonalized, that doesn't mean it isn't still a problem for modern democratic societies that have developed out of Hobbes' thought. In a regime that values impersonal and indirect government, it's not easy to be a good teacher because a teacher always bears some resemblance to a tyrant and so always risks arousing the resentment of students. To use pedagogical authority effectively in a democracy, you have to compromise with democracy's prejudice against authority. Some people, under the pressure of this prejudice, simply surrender their authority. They adopt their students' fashions and demeanors and put themselves on a first name basis with them. Uh, they take Steve Buscemi's how do you do fellow kids approach. Uh, Harvey, of course, would never be seen teaching in shorts and flip flops and no student could call him Harvey either. Uh, but he's both unobtrusive and generous with his students without either lording it over them or renouncing his authority. Now, some people complain that Harvey is too unobtrusive, that he never talks. Uh, but I remember one time when I was a graduate student, Harvey invited actually it was Maurizio Viroli. Uh, to give a lecture for PCG and had a dinner for him afterwards at his house. And Viroli was a very animated conversationalist and he entertained the entire table all night and Harvey intervened very little. And I walked home that evening with a graduate student friend of mine who had come to the dinner uh, but wasn't familiar with Harvey. And she said she was amazed by Harvey's self-restraint because <laughs> he was the only Harvard professor she'd ever encountered who was gracious enough not to dominate a discussion <laughs> and to let the guest of honor have the honor of not being talked over and contradicted all evening. <laughs> <coughs> Harvey's generosity included always inviting students to dinners like that one, uh, as well as to parties and to reading groups uh, to serve us good wine and excellent food in a beautiful house. Now, to be fair, the excellent food and the beautiful house were mainly Anna's doing, since the virtues of Harvey's cooking can only be fully appreciated by connoisseurs of hot dogs. <laughs> but the wine was Harvey's, and more importantly, the conversation and the camaraderie. Harvey introduced students to the speakers that he invited, and he encouraged his students' friendships with each other. His house was a very warm place in the often cold climate of Harvard. So surrendering pedagogical authority is wanting to be like your students. Maintaining it is to make your students want to be like you. The best pedagogical authority harnesses this kind of uh, personal admiration to orient students to, towards things uh, above public opinion, above the public opinion that rules in indirect and impersonal regimes. Harvey's virtue as a teacher, I think, is that he's easy to admire and difficult to resent, but admiring him requires taking seriously what he takes seriously and admires, which is political philosophy. Cliff, please. Uh, Professor Kogans and I, Kogans and I have met only once. So I would not describe our relationship as intimate, let alone telepathic, but as you're about to see, <laughs> no one would argue that September 1968 was the best time for a fledgling doctoral student to enroll at Harvard. The next two years were chaotic. In both years, final exams would be canceled by a supine administration uh, in, in, in the face of the antics of student radicals. In the midst of this chaos stood Harvey, firmly unabashed. His personal style was sui generis. I could describe him as a gentleman with all the reticence and deference to tradition, including Harvard tradition, that you'd expect in a gentleman. He was formal toward male students, courtly toward female ones. While he was in no way neglectful of his students, neither did he play their buddy. If you were ever to become Harvey's friend, you would have to grow into the role. Fortunately, your very studies with him promised you vast opportunities for growth. Harvey's writings were equally distinctive. I don't know whether it's just an idiosyncrasy of mine that the works of his that impressed me most deeply 
were those published while I was studying with him. Remember, remember, this was 1968. Not only was Harvey much younger, but his bibliography much shorter. The first of his writings on Machiavelli lay several years in the future. To me, his writings of the mid-60s looked weird. All that British stuff. What was up with that? <laughs> Having grown up in Chicago, where even public education was in the hands of vengeful Irish spinsters, <laughs> I wanted no truck with the British. <laughs> Burke, Bolingbroke. I'm sorry, my computer is not behaving. Besides, studying with Alan Bloom at Cornell had intoxicated me with, read with reading great books, capital G, capital B, Plato, Shakespeare, Rousseau, Nietzsche, Burke, Bolingbroke, they were the B team. <laughs> Worthy of study by someone, no doubt, but my mind was on loftier tasks, not that I could have said what those were. So it wasn't Harvey's writings on Bolingbroke and Burke or party politics that snared me. That honor fell to Hobbes and the science of indirect government, which graced the APSR in 1971, midway through my third year at Harvard. This article knocked my socks off. While I had never read Burke or Bolingbroke, I thought I knew Hobbes pretty well. I had studied him twice before, first with Bloom at Cornell, and more recently in Michael Walzer's justly celebrated seminar on him. Harvey's article, however, opened new vistas for me, not just in the study of Hobbes, but in that of modern political thought generally. If Bloom's Hobbes had been mainly psychological, Walzer's was mainly sociological. Harvey's, by contrast, was political all the way down. This was the article that first revealed to me Harvey's endless store of pixie dust. He could sprinkle it on the seemingly least promising subjects. Here's an assignment for anyone who shared my good fortune in studying with Bloom before proceeding to Harvey. Although perhaps in that room, that would only be Susan Schell. <laughs> I'm, I'm not sure. Um, first, make a list of topics that would have bored Bloom to death. <laughs> Parties, elections, representative government, <laughs> the executive, the social contract. Then make a list of topics favored by Harvey. Remarkable overlap, wouldn't you say? <laughs> so I found it bemusing that in Harvey's world, these humdrum topics were the rage. It took the Hobbes article to show me why. In his brief account of himself for this conference, Harvey asserts that, quote, the best resources of political science are its great books, where doctrines we take for granted are questioned, unquote. The Hobbes article is exhibit A, both of this principle and of Harvey's skill in executing it. Whose works are fuller than Hobbes's of concepts that we children of modern politics have come to take utterly for granted? As Plato claims in one of his letters to have made Socrates young and beautiful again, so Harvey could claim to have accomplished for Hobbes. If I may borrow a term from Russian criticism, Harvey is a master of the technique of ostrenenya, or making strange. He excels at defamiliarizing the customary, thus loosening its hold over us, while at the same time restoring its vividness. Thus did Harvey's article revolutionize my understanding of Hobbes. Previously, my Hobbes had been that of Leviathan chapter six on the passions, and of chapter 13 on the state of nature. His subsequent chapters on institutions, beginning with personation or representation, had left the callow Orwin cold. It took Harvey's article to disclose the elegance of these institutions, their graceful interplay, and their stately dance. Perhaps the most grievous gap in my understanding was my failure to grasp how Hobbes' conceptions of these institutions reflected his dialogue with Aristotle at once his teacher and his bete noir. Warming to his subject, Harvey spoke for Hobbes in describing Aristotle as, quote, the chief of incompetent political science. That's my idea of a wonderful man stealing in line. <laughs> did Harvey mean this seriously or ironically? With which of the two thinkers did Harvey himself stand? You could make a case for either reason. Certainly Harvey presented Hobbes' side of the argument as enormously powerful. Harvey stressed that Hobbes had returned to battle with the Stagirite again and again. He showed that his rejection of Aristotle was both more focused and more comprehensive than I had grasped. 
Such crucial features of its supersession of him as the replacement of distinctions of re regimes by those of mere forms of government, the introduction of representative government, and the very centrality of the social contract all followed from a single fateful break with Aristotle, the rejection of the primacy of political opinion. It was precisely institutional, the institutionalism of modern thought, the quote, science of indirect government of the title of Harvey's article that displayed most clearly the consequences of this epochal theoretical rift. Further proof I had drunk Harvey's Kool-Aid was my own first published article on the sovereign authorization in Hobbes. It is best read as a lengthy footnote to Harvey's piece. While not rising to Harvey's level, I did imitate him in focusing on an institution of Hobbes and inferring the thought underlying it. And fortunately for me, the habit of reading Harvey that I first contracted while studying with him has persisted through the more than five decades since. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> well, um, I just, as, a, as a child of 1968, I, <laughs> I, 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 I share all of that. Yeah, and and, and uh, we'll now go on to add my own, little, my own little footnote. Choosing among Harvey's extraordinary contributions to our understanding of political life is indeed a formidable task, not least because of unceasing productivity, as witnessed by the wonderful new book published last month. Machiavelli's Effectual Truth, which I meant to have a copy of here, but I forgot to let it home, with many more, uh, no doubt, to follow. Machiavelli's Effectual Truth not only sheds additional light on that seemingly innocuous phrase, to whose critical importance Harvey was, I think, the first to draw serious attention, it also makes newly evident the notion, that notion's link to current understandings of the role of government and executive power as well as to modern realism in its many guises. And as Harvey shows in this new book and in rich detail, it also exerted profound and underappreciated influence on Montesquieu. But that's not all. <laughs> Idealism in the modern sense has equally Nickelodeon roots, as, as we learn uh, in a few quick sentences in the introduction, making Kant the conspicuous white knight as Harvey archly puts it, of Machiavelli's cavalry. Or is that Calvary? <laughs> in short, Kant is no less a subscriber to the effectual truth in Machiavelli's sense than is Locke and Madison. But what about Kant, or Rousseau for that matter, whose intellectual legacy for good or ill <clears throat> continues to inform the modern state as we now know it? Harvey also sketches in a few brief and illuminating strokes the hidden linkage between Kantian idealism and the Machiavellian realism that Kant both takes for granted and in part depends on. And we could also add Rousseau, whose recasting of the relation between the sexes seems to be the very model of indirect government as a rule that is all the more powerful for not speaking in its own name. And a model that would seem to bear on Harvey's own most prescient account the contemporary crisis surrounding the ideas of manhood and womanhood. Let me then take a few moments to, to briefly elaborate on Harvey's incisive sketch of Kant's Machiavellian debt, a subject that might well serve as the theme of another book. Here are four of what I take to be Harvey's chief suggestions. First, that insofar as Machiavellian realism takes on the project of transforming the world in accordance with a plan, it is also necessarily idealistic and in a new specifically modern way. Two, that inasmuch as it aims to be effective, that is to work through the forces of nature, Machiavelli's idealism is also necessarily materialistic. Third, that insofar as it means to conquer fortune, Machiavellian realism replaces the classical distinction between nature and chance with the simplifying but also highly ambiguous concept of necessity. Necessity on Harvey's reading has the dual function and, and many more functions, but at least these, the dual function of both excusing or deflecting responsibility and giving new scope to human virtue through the anticipation of necessities before they arise. 
Four, that given, quote, the tenacity with which most people cling to morality, mm. quoting, mm. quoting Harvey, unquote, mm. Kant's new kind of moral necessity, grounded in reason alone, mm. can be more effectual in the long run than Machiavellian realism narrowly construed. Thanks to Kant's promised reconciliation through history of man's natural asocial sociability on the one hand, and his freedom, or the clinging of the people to morality on the other. Kant, the errant knight, is thus no less a would-be founder and hence a philosophic successor to Machiavelli than more obvious or obviously moderate thinkers like Montesquieu and Tocqueville. Though Kant's own moderation, even more than that of his teacher Rousseau, is admittedly less conspicuous than his idealism. How then might that alternative or supplementary line of descent through Rousseau, Herder, Kant, Hegel, and beyond provisionally be framed? And beginning with Harvey's own suggestion, both as to the tenacity of popular moralism and its link to the two basic humors, as Machiavelli sees it, that is, the wish to oppress and the wish not to be oppressed. This difference on Harvey's account stems mainly, if not solely, from the latter's weakness, or at least Machiavelli's Harvey's account of Machiavelli, real or perceived, and inferior to virtue or imprezza, that is, to the imposition of form on a matter that is inherently recalcitrant to being formed. But what if virtue literally understood its strength has or can assume another intrinsically more stable form, namely the virtue of the people, who Machiavelli calls più onesti, more decent, than the great, whose desires, unlike those of um, uh, Igrandi, that is the people, um, can in principle be widely, if not universally, satisfied. Such, I would hazard, is the Rousseauian insight that Kant absorbed, and it forms the basis, in turn, of his own moralism, grounded in the rational idea of a kingdom of ends that is realizable in principle. Indeed, following Harvey's lead, one could perhaps with no less justice also trace Kant's vaunted transcendental idealism to Machiavelli's effectual truth. For that term is itself highly ambiguous. It could either imply that the effectual truth is all there is, or that there is truth of another kind, perhaps higher kind, allowing morality to occupy the space from which Machiavelli's effectual truth effectively withdraws. Machiavelli asserts, of course, that that space is filled with imaginary republics and other philosophic dreams. But his artfully chosen phrase, verita fetuale, as Harvey has himself artly reminded us, can also be understood for what Kant will call the noumenal world, occupied by things in themselves. But these are deep waters, concerning which I only wish there were time to draw Harvey out, or for the rich, ever provocative insight from which all his many students have gained and continue to gain so much. Let me close then on a note of profound gratitude for the stintless intellectual and personal generosity that Harvey has lavished on all of us, and not least on his women students and colleagues over the many decades of his career here at his beloved Harvard. <clears throat> you remember that Jim, uh, to start with, was talking a little bit about the familiar contest between Harvey and contextualism. <laughs> Maurizio also talked about that last night a little bit. And Harvey has always teased me about my Cambridge origins. But I also remember very vividly that when I was debating about whether to leave Cambridge and come to Harvard, uh, what Harvey said is I should come because it would be very good for me. And, <laughs> and I think, as he was so often, he was right about that. I feel that at least either I have changed or he has, because I came to see there's an enormous commonality behind our supposed differences. And what I want to do is to say a little bit about that, because I think it's, it's the thing I've come really to realize about Harvey. Uh, too late, actually, in a way. I wish I had talked to you more about many of these themes while we were still had rooms close to one another on the fourth floor. First, I think we actually, it turns out, we always had common enemies. 
um, both methodologically, and it turns out uh, increasingly politically as well, surprisingly. I think it's worth remembering how Harvey began, at least as I understand it, um, as a political scientist, projecting a work on Weber and US parties. Uh, I think actually Harvey on Weber would be a really interesting conversation, actually. And it's something that has slipped through uh, the literature. But he became a political theorist or historian of political sort, an apostate political scientist, you might say, uh, which he has remained, uh, after reading, and I was struck by this, not actually meeting Strauss, so that it's, it was reading the book uh, that made an enormous difference to him. Um, I think there was remarkably little serious history of political theory in the English-speaking world, either in America or in Britain, in the 1950s. By serious, I mean political theory that, thought, that saw itself as having a serious purpose. I don't know what Harvey read as an undergraduate. I'd like to know that uh, in this area. But I, I, you can see, I think, in retrospect, why someone opening Strauss's Natural Right and History would, in this respect, have a revelation in the sense that they could see that, that the political theory and its history doesn't consist simply of an analysis of existing politics, a greater systematization of the, of the theory, of an account of the history of the development of these institutions, whatever, whatever, but at, at some level sought to transform politics or the way of life that people have in the modern world that it offers, in a sense, a master discipline. And that's a very, very exciting sight, uh, even if you don't accept the substance, or not all, at least, the substance of what Strauss went on to say. The sense of the seriousness and the importance of the project, uh, I have come to see as enormously important and, and, and um, influential. Um, the thing was that both in England, well, in the US, I think the master discipline of politics was positivist political science. Um, and in the UK, the master discipline was what you might call Oxford analytic philosophy. Uh, neither very interested in, or neither thought that history and the historical imagination, historical understanding uh, was gonna have very much purchase on modern politics. The curious thing about Cambridge, uh, which I came out of in the late 60s, is that there was a great deal of skepticism and hostility to uh, positivist political science. I mean, that is actually the theme, if you read them carefully, of the early works in the 60s of people like, well, starting with John Pocock, Laslett, Quentin, Skinner, John Donne, et cetera, all that crowd. Um, but it didn't issue, at least at first, it didn't issue in a sense that doing the history of political thought would have a proper critical purchase on modern politics and be able to say something about it. In fact, Quentin famously, in a remark he subsequently came to regret, I know, uh, said that uh, the implication of the, uh, the way in which he wanted to write the history of political thought was, when it came to our own political theory, we had to do it ourselves. I mean, very famous line, as I said, he came to regret it, but it sort of captured something of that. Uh, that, uh, that attitude. So there was a rather curious feature that there was a skepticism about the positivists over there, but a refusal really to say that the historical inquiry, which was very exciting, you know, what people were doing was new. It seemed again to have a very serious point to it, but it didn't seem to have the critical edge. It should be said the actual practice of that generation, and I think of my own generation even more, uh, belied the, belied the, uh, the, 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 the program uh, that we actually all, in fact, we didn't spend our time reading 17th century pamphlets, as maybe we should have done. Indeed, I started doing that. It became extremely boring. Uh, that instead we read Hobbes, Machiavelli, Locke, you know, that's, uh, that, you know as I said. Um, but the, I, I came to realize when I came to America that the Straussian tradition had played an enormous important part within United States intellectual life. Because you might say it preserved or recreated the importance of a historical theoretic vision um, in the wasteland of American uh, positivist political science. It kept the torch burning, and that was an enormously important thing that it did. And Harvey was first, first among equals, but maybe first 
without equals uh, in doing that. And I also came to think that he was right to be wary of crude contextualism. Um, uh, as I said, because he, the, the, the danger of it, like positivist political science, was that it too ran the risk of eliminating the critical edge that comes from a proper understanding of the way we can read these writers. I mean, I haven't got time to say more about that. That's something I've thought about a lot uh, in recent years. Um, that my own view is, and in a way it's like what Jim was saying, uh, to read a work in, the co in its context is to see surprising things about it often. It's not actually to lose the sense of originality. Uh, it's to, it's to, from our point of view, it's to gain a sense of the originality because we suddenly see, gosh, here is someone who is in fact talking about this feature of 17th century politics. We hadn't sort of quite seen that before, but that feature of 17th century politics turns out to be very important when we start thinking about our own politics. And we begin to get an idea through these texts, which is surprising, critical, original, which we can't get by doing it ourselves, to go back to Quentin's remark. Um, we can't, I don't think we can do it through political philosophy as understood in philosophy departments, because that tends merely to reproduce a set of conventional beliefs, which we can undermine by reading these works in a particular, in particular ways. And there are many different ways of reading them. Uh, but if, as long as they're read with this critical or undermining character, I think we're all doing something rather similar. The other curious thing, though, is not only did I come to see that in some sense, methodologically, we were converging, uh, that I deeply respected what Harvey and some of the other Straussians were doing. But weirdly, in the last few years, I think we've come to actually converge in a very surprising way on certain substantive political interests and commitments. And the thing that struck me most about this, I'll just finish by saying this, it was a piece that Harvey wrote in the Wall Street Journal last year. Um, you may have read it, on why we shouldn't use opinion polls instead of elections. Now, what actually astonished me about this uh, was I didn't know that Harvey had been thinking about this, but I'd actually already been thinking and indeed writing exactly the same thing. Uh, in the lectures I gave at Princeton in 2019, which of course hadn't been published, um, are about to be published. Uh, exactly this question of how strange it is that we have a representative system, opinion polling and so on, um, which from some perspectives ought to be superior to the business of voting. And Harvey saw that puzzle, he saw that, He's, as far as I could see, uh, apart from myself. Uh, and it should be said, actually, I don't know if you know this, Harvey, Isaac Asimov, did you ever read his short story on the elector? Did you know that he wrote it uh, shortly after the Eisenhower Adlai Stevenson election, when uh, CBS, I think, predicted the result on for the first time. They called the result with a computer analysis of the votes, but when the time when Stevenson was going to win. CBS said, no, Eisenhower's going to win. And, and Asimov wrote this wonderful short story in which the future in America, you have one elector. He's chosen <laughs> by Univac, Asimov's computer, as the fully representative person. <laughs> and in a great ceremony, he goes up and he, gi he, make, he gives his vote. And that decides, <laughs> <laughs> that decides the presidential election. So that's an extreme version, but the same theory. And I was struck by the fact that, in, you know, one of the, the people that uh, Harvey is, is gently uh, responding to is Sid Verbum. Uh, I mean, in other words, it's in, uh, by name in that article. That is to say that this is Harvey again, pointing out why a certain kind of political science um, has, can't see some of the fundamental features about our politics. It can't, given its assumptions, explain why it's the case that it's tremendously important that we all go and vote rather than merely sit back and be represented by some mechanical system like opinion polls or Asimov's individual voter. So I, I could name many other areas where I've begun to see this. But as I said, I, in a way, I take from this a regret because we've spent many years 
uh, sitting in fa faculty meetings, uh, being neighbors on the fourth floor. But, and it turns out we had much more to say to one another than I had ever realized. So I'm sorry about that, Harvey, but I'm glad I can now pay my debt to you. Well, uh, our, our panelists have been spectacularly well behaved, so we have um, exactly the right amount of time uh, for uh, for discussion. Uh, Harvey, did you want to say something first, or, or do you want to wait and hold your fire until later? Later. later. <laughs> uh, uh, the floor is open. Can people wait for the mic? Yes, please do wait for the mic because uh, we're, uh, we're we're being immortalized. <laughs> Oh, sorry, Ross, I thought you, that was a hand. Oh, yeah. I wondered if I could invite um, Harvey to say something about contextualism, <laughs> since that was a theme. Contextualism cannot identify greatness. Contextualism takes the great and finds the context in which they lived and to which they appealed and explains them by the context instead of the context by them. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, Maurizio, sure, please. Why break the habit of a lifetime? <laughs> Harvey, how can you identify greatness if you don't compare the author you're studying with others <coughs> who belong to the same period? In other words, don't you need the, con <coughs> the context properly and intelligently studied in order to see the greatness and appreciate it? <laughs> you Thank God we have two microphones. Okay. <laughs> uh, <laughs> the context um, should be studied from the standpoint of the great man who transcends it. He knows it better than we do or than we can find without his help. So if you want to know Machiavelli's context, look at what Machiavelli says about his context, at least to begin with. That's the way to do it. <laughs> and maybe you could uh, introduce yourselves. Uh, I should have said at the beginning, it would be great. Hi, I'm Vicki Sullivan at, of Tufts University, and I'm really pleased and honored to be here. And I write on Machiavelli myself, so I owe a huge debt um, to Professor Mansfield. And I thought I feel as though I knew him well before I ever met him, um, having read his, his books very, very, very carefully. Um, but I'm wondering whether there's actually sort of a way to reconcile contextualism um, and textualism in that um, the writer sort of gives you the context, um, not only the, the great people he's responding to, but also really important events that we need to know more about. And they sort of, you know, assume that we should. Uh, the Alexander's conquests, for example, uh, the rise of Christianity. Um, and so I wonder whether that's really a way to, to reconcile textualism and contextualism. In other words, if you just take the book and don't look beyond that and don't even look where the author is pointing, you're not going to see everything the author wants you to point out. <laughs> uh, 
Uh, yes, that's right, I think, Vicky. You're, you're right, of course, Maurizio, that, uh, that you need to compare <laughs> um, to see um, what's, what greatness is. But if you uh, look at what uh, Machiavelli considers to be his context, you do find it's uh, Aristotle and Plato, the ancient authors that he read and he speaks of in his famous letter of December 10, 1513, in which he describes a day in his life and ends by saying <clears throat> that he goes to his um, study, puts on courtly robes, and um, reads the ancient authors, and he asks them questions, and they, in their humanity, answer me. So that's his context. Yeah. Well, that's at least the principal part of his context. The trouble with contextualism is that it looks too closely to um, what the great authors had surrounding them in their time. Um, and so it looks at lesser people than they. They are often or usually maybe even universally, concerned with each other. The great authors speak to each other, to the great authors. You need to get at the conversation at that level. Paul Carice, I'm at Arizona State University, um, but was was here in the in the Boston area uh, for doctoral studies at Boston College. I wanted to ask a question that might fall between the gap of this panel and and the next panel, um, which is um, the delightful news for me um, as, since Vicky just spoke uh, that Harvey's new book has a substantial attention for Montesquieu. Uh, in the midst of a book on, on Machiavelli. But uh, I, w I wanted to put on the record the, the collection of essays that Harvey published in the early 90s, America's Constitutional Soul, uh, which might fall in the gap between these two panels. So uh, I, I'll characterize it my own way. Maybe Harvey would say something about it or, or panelists now or in the next session that the political science of Publius of, of the American Constitution, the ideas behind the American Constitution have a, have a greatness that um, has, had been in the 20th century and perhaps earlier neglected. And so to rediscover that greatness. So here was Harvey not writing about Burke and Bolingbroke, uh, but writing about, about Publius and the American founding and the, the richness of that political science, which had been unjustly and uh, neglected or, or underappreciated yeah. before we get to Tocqueville, <laughs> before we get to the Democracy in America translation. Um, and, and, and it's more than just the critique of modern social science um, per se. It's an appreciation, appreciation of the greatness of that political science. Yes, we have... Uh, we have Thanks, uh, Catherine Hansen, MIT. Um, I just wanted to mention that um, when Harvey was started talking about retiring, I was trying to talk him out of it because he's such a great teacher. He still has so many wonderful students flocking to him. And even at 91, he's just in the most incredible shape. Um, and he said, that no, he thought it was time to retire, but his reason was not that it was time to take a rest, that he'd done enough. It was that he needed time to write three more books. <laughs> <laughs> and so I wonder if he could tell us all a little bit about those three books that are in the works, um, what we still have to look forward to in the Mansfield oeuvre. Care careful, because once you tell us, you have to write them. 
Uh, that's right. I, I, uh, I want to write them. <laughs> Whether um, I will be able to, I don't know. So, but uh, the first one is uh, a write-up of the lectures I gave in Government 1061 on uh, the history of modern political philosophy. That's the title of it. So uh, that's Machiavelli, Hobbes, Locke, Rousseau, Kant, Hegel, Marx, Nietzsche. <laughs> Eight people. And I have a theme, which you could call quickly, the rise and fall of rational control. So that's, that's number one. And number two is um, Gulliver's Travels, which I think is a work of comparative government. Four regimes are visited by, travel, by the traveler, Gulliver. And uh, there's a lot of philosophy or political philosophy, too, there. If you look at the way in which uh, Swift, Jonathan Swift, the funniest man who ever lived, um, begins his, um, um, his first book, which is, um, this is what's happened. This is, now I'm showing I'm 91. <laughs> Uh, the, the name of his uh, a, a tale of a tub, a tale of a tub, and that if you look on the first couple of pages, you'll see that uh, Swift announces that he's been put at the head of a committee. Actually, he's self-appointed himself uh, to deal with the uh, effects of Thomas Hobbes's Leviathan. He said a, a Leviathan is a whale. And these, there was a story that uh, the sailors, um, when they met up with a whale, uh, would throw a tub in the water to distract it from the ship in order to save the ship. And uh, that, that was what Swift set out to do in that book. And I think uh, Gulliver's Travels is part of that enterprise. And, uh, and then the third book would be something on American political parties today, which I've sort of done half of in, in various uh, writings, uh, taking up the question of uh, survey data. Survey is opinion. Data is what is given. Science studies what is given. It doesn't discuss or consider opinion. Did Galileo take a survey to find out whether the earth moved or not? No. <laughs> so how is it that political scientists think that from a survey they can get to Data, survey is opinion. Survey deals with things that are said. Things that are said put into Latin are dicta. Modern political science tries to go from dicta to data. <laughs> and it does so through a process of Let's call it mumbo jumbo. <laughs> I'm avoiding the political scientists. Anyway, yeah, uh, other points. <laughs> uh, hands on. Thank you. Thank you, Professor. Thank you, everyone. Uh, my name is Hanson Lee. I'm here at the government department and student Harvey's. Um, I remember the first time I met Harvey, he told me that as a teacher, his factual truth is his students. And he pointed to the pictures of his students uh, on the shelf uh, in his office. And that deeply touched me. And um, something about pedagogy was mentioned here and then the similarity and the parallel to 
political authority. So I want to ask a question from the perspective of students. Um, the, the Athenian uh, aristocratic youths who were being hunted down in the streets of Athens, they didn't have the corpus of Plato, so they only relied on dialogues. Uh, Alexander had recourse to some notes, uh, but he also had dialogues in the cave. Um, when it comes to Machiavelli, he was educated, contextually speaking, he was educated um, in the curricula of uh, rhetoric and grammar. In Firenze, at the time, it was the center of uh, these teachings, but he also speak with the ancients and learn from the ancients through dialogues uh, in the evening when he put on this rope and actually go into the palace of, of knowledge and truth. So I wonder, my question for either the panelists or for Harvey himself is, as a student, you have a dialogical teacher who was alive and all the teachers here uh, and my own teachers who uh, have conversations with me, but you also have teachers from the ancients with whom you, your Sabaza Strauss, and you're supposed to be able to dialogue with them in the evening, at least, if not during the day. Uh, what is the difference between those experiences and how do you mix and match those experiences to uh, realize your own effectual truth as, as students who are going on to different um, uh, enterprises? Thank you. <laughs> well, I mean, it's um, dialogue. Dialogue may be this, a slightly misleading term. Actually, maybe a slightly misleading term in both cases, but that's today talking to the living teacher and reading the dead book. Um, I mean, one curious thing I have discovered it, well, do you remember? You might remember that um, uh, I, it's sometimes the case that people that writers see that readers understand them better than they understood themselves. Uh, this was, I think Eliot says this somewhere, I'm feeling Auden says it somewhere too, that, it's, it, that sometimes people, living people, real people, act in a way out of instinct. They have a sense of what's important um, and it's somewhat fleeting. Um, I mean, I myself have come to sort of in a sense make sense of my own views in retrospect. I mean, I'm kind of living a Hegelian life, uh, that it all seems to make sense. <laughs> the older one gets, one starts to see the point of it. Um, so, so that I think there isn't, I mean, one shouldn't have too kind of stylized, I don't know, concretized picture in which, you know, the wise person says something and then there's a back and forth. It's, it's not, at least my experience, it's not quite, it's not quite like that, talking to real, real people. Um, and it's not quite like that reading a book either. Um, the, there's always openness. You always going. You might find something, some interesting manuscript, which you know shows that what we thought they thought isn't the case, and so on. So I, I think there's a, in a sense, you're thinking in somewhat stylized terms rather than the looseness, the oddness, the oddity of actually talking to people and reading books. Yeah. So in the I think you officially have the last word. Oh dear, the first and the last word. So uh, dear, I, I don't feel adequate. Oh, to this. you have the second. You have the penultimate. Word. All right, good, 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 excellent. So I was just going to comment that the um, ancients distinguished between Aristotelian dialogue, where a master is asked questions by his students, and uh, this is what Cicero does. This is what. Machiavelli does in The Art of War. There's someone who knows the answers and you ask questions and it's uh, informational exchange. But then there's also the Socratic dialogue, uh, which we think of as a kind of cross-examination of experts and the exposure of their ignorance. But uh, Socrates and Plato place great emphasis in Socratic dialogue on love between the master and the student and that the master has to care about the soul of the student. And that's something that Aristotle didn't dream of, I don't think, uh, but something that we find in, in the teaching of Harvey Mansfield. And very quickly, uh, Rita and Cliff, yeah. Uh, okay, well, so uh, in the spirit of Vicky, also as a woman, I feel that I, I'm compelled to reconcile the dueling men uh, here <laughs> who are fighting, uh, the, the contextualists and the Straussians, and, and the one suggestion that I would offer to do that is that you can see even in this room, and this has always been the case in the government department, that many people who studied with Harvey also studied with Richard. Uh, and that both of them were on many committees and then Eric, when he came later, um, I think there are at least five or six people in this room who've had that experience. And so uh, 
to the degree that Straussianism and contextualism are opposed, I think there's also a, a very uh, important degree to which they're reconcilable uh, and that we can see that in the effectual truth uh, of both of your students. Probably. Um, I wanted to respond to Mr. Lee's question. Um, why not combine the two? They are quite different, but they can be combined. So my closest colleague at Toronto, Ryan Bald, and I get together with our students um, informally to read old texts. The students get the benefit of our superior expertise. We get the benefit of their, of their freshness and enthusiasm. In this informal circumstance, we're relatively, we're relatively equals conventionally speaking. And um, there's a passage in Xenophon's memorabilia, which should probably be better known, where Socrates says that he himself gets together with his friends to read old books. And sort of presents this as the peak experience of his, of, 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 of his life. So um, I'm sure there are many other people here who have experience of this. So that's what I would suggest to you is to sort of combine the benefits of both activities. Well, thank you all so much. Thank you to the panelists for getting us off to such a fantastic start. Thank you to uh, Harvey for uh, his contributions. And uh, we now have a break exactly on time. And uh, please join us uh, for the second panel uh, immediately after. <laughs>
thinking about American constitutional government. And that's really where the political science, I think, comes uh, through quite forcefully in Harvey's writing, especially his most recent work, uh, including the Wall Street Journal article that was mentioned. I'd read a longer version of that earlier that Harvey had passed my way. And I do hope that you find a place for the light of day for that. And also the, the article on parties, because I'll talk a little bit about that. Maybe this will spur you to write that last, that third book that you were discussing. So uh, Harvey, as you heard, is a critic of modern public opinion research. Um, It was interesting, his answer went in a different direction than I thought it would, because as I read um, his writing on this, his answer is really quite different in the text. Um, But then there's the dicta that we just heard. the text really takes on Sid Verba and Mo Fiorina for expressing a public opinion or distilling really public opinion, divorced somehow from its essence, divorced from its meaning um, and where that meaning comes from. It's, it's stripped of its metal, its force. People have been asked to answer a question but that's the question that the researcher wanted to answer. It's not necessarily the thing that the person wanted to say. And I think this is actually, for people doing work in this area, a very big problem. And we know it is a very big problem. We've known it's a very big problem for a very long time. I think to paraphrase Vio Key, we know that public opinion is vitally important and we know that it's there. We just have a hard time getting our arms around it. And so I have a, I'm gonna, toss the challenge back to Harvey, and we can have lunch later about it, which is, I wanna know what political theorists can tell us about how to do our job better. I don't wanna know what political theorists think that we're doing wrong, (laughs) because you always tell us that. (laughs) The, The second theme is ambition. Now, ambition is probably, as I read Harvey's writing on constitutional government, the central thing he's grappling with, and it ties it back to Machiavelli. And I think uh, as we think about ambition today, and if you just think about like ambitious politicians and so forth, the word that would probably come closest to mind of what we mean today is ego, right? That these people are fulfilling their, their secret deepest ego. But that's not what Madison had in mind at all. Um, so the, the most famous line, or, or Hamilton either, Uh, comes from Federalist 51, which is that ambition must be made to counteract ambition. Usually we stop there. Don't. Uh, The interest of the man must be connected with the constitutional rights of the place. So we have a kind of Republican twist to this that's quite important. It may be a reflection on human nature that such devices should be necessary to control the abuses of government. So is this all just about ego? And I think the answer is yes. And one of the things that I learned from Harvey in graduate school was always to dig deeper in the text. So when you come across an important concept or idea, find out what it means and what it meant to the person who was writing the article or book. What did, Madison was quite steeped uh, in uh, history, read Cicero, uh, uh, and other Roman authors quite closely. But what did ambition mean to the Romans? Ambition to the Romans meant something very different. And if you look up the root of the word, kind of confusing what ambition could be about. It comes from the root word ambare or ambiri, which means to walk around. So how would walking around be related to our ambitions to get something done? Well, it turns out that ambire was also the term used for walking around collecting votes. So it was very much the most practical part of Roman political life was going around and getting the support of other citizens. It was the expression of public opinion. So one other reading of Madison that Harvey's work has opened up is the possibility that we're really talking about something much more prosaic, which is people actually going around and collecting votes and one group collecting votes to oppose another group. And that is really what is at the heart of the matter. Um, 
Interestingly enough, we've recently seen people in the U.S. House of Representatives show their medal, their ability to collect votes. And I think what they're also lacking is something else that Harvey writes quite a bit about, which is virtu. They're not that good at it. <laughs> Third theme that I'd like to call out in Harvey's recent writings, and one that I hope we can talk about further, is the place of political parties in the modern American um, uh, setting, or really in any setting, which is uh, Harvey has a fantastic article, very uh, thought provoking, which argues that parties are conspiracies um, and they are part of the whole. But one of the interesting aspects of conspiracy is that it is an attempt of a group to impose its will on the whole that is carried out clandestine in private. Um, and I think this conception of party opens up a different perspective on some of the critiques of things like campaign finance and so forth. It's what really bothers people is not corruption, it's the conspiratorial flavor of it and the conspiratorial flavor of many of the party actions. So I hope we can have a conversation later about what Harvey really thinks of the conspiracy and how to contain that conspiracy. So it's a third question I will put to you, either over lunch or when we have Q&A. Thank you, Harvey, for many, many years of the most thought-provoking conversation. Thank you, Steve. Uh, Chef. Uh, Steve and I are the only non-theorists here, um, and we are surrounded by all these brilliant and rhetorically gifted theorists. So it's a bit intimidating, but I will say spending a lot of time around Harvey Mansfield, I've gotten used to feeling intimidated. Mm -hmm. And I assume that many of you have felt that same way too. Um, Harvey Mansfield has been my teacher for 52 years and counting, because we now have a new source of his teaching. Um, all of you have benefited from his writing and his brilliant lectures on uh, great political philosophers, ancient and modern. But I want to emphasize that Harvey Mansfield is not just a political theorist. He is a political scientist um, from whom non-theorists can learn a great deal. Um, and I would say that he's not just a critic of contemporary political science. He has offered some alternatives, some important insights that we can benefit. Um, from his first course on forms of government to his last class on um, uh, the political science of American democracy, he's tried to connect the grand themes of political philosophy to the operation of actual regimes, especially the American regime. The thinker to which he, which he devoted most attention, Aristotle, Machiavelli, Burke, Tocqueville, the authors of the Federalist Papers, are the ones who had most to say about what motivates people to engage in politics and how to construct the best uh, regime in practice, not just in speech. Mansfield's understanding of the distinctive features of modern liberal democracy has helped him appreciate the founding principles of this novel form of government, the difficulties of establishing these regimes, the challenge of preserving them, and the peculiar operation um, of these regimes. Features of contemporary liberal democracy that modern scientists has, for the most part, failed to appreciate. Um, now, I, I hasten to add that I'm not saying that Harvey Mansfield has a political methodology. Anyone who remembers his quip that studying methodology is like practicing seduction on an empty couch <laughs> 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 would stare, stay clear of attributing that to him. But I do want to tick off a couple of things um, that political science needs to learn from Harvey Mansfield. Um, and um, uh, one of these is an insight that comes from Plato, Aristotle, and Shakespeare, and I'd say probably Swift, that is the importance of Thumos as a political, a powerful driver uh, of political action. Uh, fortunately, Brian Garston is gonna explain this better than I ever could, so I will say no more on that subject right now. A second, more inconvenient theme comes from Machiavelli, how the ugly necessities of politics require the executive on occasion to execute people in order to faithfully execute the laws. Um, Justice Scalia once wrote an article with the politically incorrect title, Administrative Law is Not for Sissies. Mansfield and Machiavelli remind us that some features of governing, even in a decent constitutional government, are not for the squeamish. 
A third theme, uh, and Steve mentioned this uh, briefly, is parties and partisanship. Um, here, uh, Harvey has drawn on Aristotle and Burke. In his recent work, uh, Harvey has developed Aristotle's discussion of the underlying principles of the oligarchic and democratic parties. In his earliest work on Burke and Brolingbrook, he probed the paradoxes of party government by examining the arguments of Burke and to a lesser extent, Jefferson. Party government, he showed, is not a natural, inevitable development of democratic politics. It requires a founding. And it, because it requires a founding, it requires a justification and a modification of previous ex, uh, expectations of Republican government. Finally, and most importantly, um, are Mansfield's insights on the underpinning of influential, resilient institutions, especially our constitutional institutions. To be powerful and lasting, these institutions must be much more than simply the rules of the game. Because if they're just the rules of the game, those who are in power are going to change them. Um, look at what's happening in the House of Representatives right now. Uh, what you see is when the rules change uh, and don't have any underpinnings, those institutions began to begin to crumble. Powerful, enduring institutions, in contrast, are based on a broadly sh uh, shared sense of purpose. Um, in a bureaucracy, we call this a sense of agency mission. In an extended republic, we call it a national creed. With more sophistication than I can muster, Russ will explain uh, Harvey's arguments about how formal institutions develop and rely upon aspirations that attract rather than personal motives that impel. It might seem here that Mansfield merely follows his famous colleagues, Louis Hartz and Sam Huntington. But unlike Sam Huntington, he did not see the American creed as a motley connection of unconnected, partially conflicted values. And unlike Hartz, he did not see American liberalism as a one-dimensional knee-jerk ideology. Like his colleague Michael Sandel, his understanding of the liberal tradition is more subtle and more profound. His extensive work on Tocqueville calls our attention to the often neglected volume two of democracy in America. There Tocqueville identifies the philosophical method of the Americans and explains the Janus uh, faced nature of American individualism. Um, I would quickly note that if you want to understand something as prosaic as social security, uh, the structure of that important act, you should read the short chapters in Democracy in America on individualism. A big point here is to understand our most important institutions, you must understand their underlying purpose and ethics, and their ethos. To do this, you must be willing to investigate the set of political beliefs that energize them. Political science well understood, thus leads us back to and demands serious engagement with political theory. Mansfield's political science is closest to Tocqueville. Like Tocqueville, Mansfield is a friendly critic of democracy, not a thor thoroughgoing Democrat. He has long stressed the need for constitutional restraints on the democratic will. For many years, his critics dismissed his warnings about democratic excess. But today, we are everywhere witnessing the alarming consequences of the collapse of institutional norms and practices and the dangers of unrestrained, vulgar demagoguery. Uh, Mansfield closed his essay, Political Science and the Constitution, by warning that a political science that cannot appreciate the need for constitutional restraints on democracy cannot distinguish a demagogue from a statesman. Today, as demagoguery rears its ugly head and constitutional norms are everywhere under attack, we should return with new attention uh, to the political science of Harvey Mansfield. Thanks, Shep. And I like the way you, just in passing, gave assignments to the next two panelists. <laughs> <laughs> My assignment so, is to be, did you say sophisticated? <laughs> yes. Oh, gosh. Um, well, I'm instead, I'm going to, I, I slept so fitfully last night um, and uh, both moved by the sweetness of the occasion um, and <clears throat> by the, um, by the, by the sadness that comes, I think, with, a, with marking the passage of time, um, that instead I have to share with you a dream I had. And I think, like Cliff, um, this is, this is like, really going off the tracks here. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> and we haven't, even, we haven't even left the tracks yet. Yeah, great. Right. <laughs> it's going to get really. I like that, involved? Cliff. I, uh, <laughs> I, was tele I, was, I think I was communicating telepathically with Rita because in the dream, I encountered Harvey, and it was in Litauer Hall, the, the home of the, the real Department of Government. Um, and, uh, 
and and it was uh, in the atrium there at the bottom of the stairway. And Harvey, you were wearing a tie dye shirt, <laughs> and oh. your hair was down to your shoulders, um, and you're wearing sandals, um, and uh, and cut off jeans. Um, and I said, Mr. Mansfield. He said, call me Harv. <laughs> <laughs> and said, I'd like to uh, know when your office hours are. I'd like to come talk with you. I have a question. I was auditing his class in ancient political thought. I have a question about forms and formal causes. He said, dude, <laughs> come whenever. <laughs> Uh, whenever you feel like it, come. So, so that night, after uh, finishing up at the pub, I thought I'd drop in to see what might be happening in the Harv's office. And, uh, and I went up and I could, hear, um, I could hear some tunes coming out of the crack of the door, Grateful Dead. Um, and I knocked and opened the door and there was Harvey leaning back with his feet up on his desk Incense burning, but not enough to overwhelm the, the, the suggestion that someone had been smoking weed. And, uh, and I said, what is it? And he said, it's Hawaiian cosmic wonder. It's the best. <laughs> and uh, and, 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 and I, I said, well, I've come with a question. I said, I, 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 I don't understand the forms. I don't understand forms. What are forms? these things that you talk about so often and write about so much. And, uh, and there was a long pause. And he looked at me and smiled and said, yes. And then there was another long pause. <laughs> and I wondered if he might be napping. <laughs> and, and, uh, and he said, listen, just listen. And the Grateful Dead were playing. And, uh, and they were in their drum solo. The Grateful Dead are a remarkable band because they have two drummers. And in every show after the intermission, they have a long drum solo that goes on and on and, 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 and carries people just as the darkness is kind of falling during the dead show. This drum solo takes people away out, outside themselves and outside their, their place. And, uh, and, Listen, he said, this is my favorite jam band. This is a bootleg from Red Rocks, June 24th, 1974. Just listen. And, uh, and I listened and I, I said, well, what, you know, what about the forms? <laughs> what are the forms? And he said, the forms are like a scene. A form is like a scene. And, uh, and so you can imagine a scene, scene, classroom. And you can imagine, as soon as you hear the word, what the scene is, what it looks like, and conjure a, a, an, an image or scene, courtroom, different than a classroom, or scene, living room, or even scene, dead show. And, and, and just as, it's, as you must wear a suit in a courtroom, you must not wear a suit to the dead show. In any scene, some things are appropriate and some things are inappropriate. And there's a certain kind of behavior that the scene calls out and calls forth in a way of thinking and being and feeling. And, and that's a, a, a form, is like a scene. Like this scene, um, the dead show scene, which is the anti-form form. The dead were the house band for Ken Kesey's acid tests in 1965-66, where people were experimenting with LSD and uh, chronicled famously by Thomas Wolfe in the electric, electric Kool-Aid acid test. And, uh, and it was there playing for um, Ken Kesey and these trippers um, in the mid-60s that the, that the dead learned how to jam and became the band that they were and, and created, believe it or not, the form that became their show. And, and after the drum solo, um, in every dead show, what comes next is space. And space is this very, very disruptive and some, it's a disturbing part of a dead show, even for deadheads. A lot of deadheads can't stand this part of the show. There's no melody, there's no rhythm. 
Um, there are no lyrics. They're just notes. They're not even discordant notes because they're not in chords. They're, they're random notes coming in random intervals. And, and they're meant to, to, to the, the, a dead show is actually um, a template for a, an LSD trip. And this is the part of the trip where the personality is disintegrated and, and you escape the form of yourself, of your own soul. And, um, and, and, and that's, what, that's what happens. And, and it is genuinely disturbing, even for the people who love the Grateful Dead. There are very few who can really handle space. And if, and if the point of a dead show, the point of the Grateful Dead were to escape form, that's where the show would end. Um, and and that's, that's, where the, that's where the trip would stop. But to, to remain there at the state of fragmentation is what they call a bad trip. If you can't get out of that fragmentation, if you're stuck there, it's really, really bad. And it might even destroy your life. It's terrifying. Um, and, and so every, at every show, that, that moment of space resolves back into rhythm and melody and harmony, back into some recognizable song that everybody loves, like Uncle John's band. And, and, and the relief comes as people re-inhabit their form, um, feeling refreshed and, in fact, reformed. And, 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 and just like that, so just like that, politics is also, of course, a form. And, and it's a form, every politics in, you know, has a form, a regime, a regime that, a, a form that, 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 that forms the souls of the, of the people in it. And, and every, every politics needs a form, even democracy, especially democracy. And so democracy needs a, a form that, that dresses the people in their best clothes, not like the tie-dye and the cutoffs, puts them in something more like a coat and tie, um, a good dress, and a clothes that remind them to be on their best behavior. Um, so so the, the form has to call out, is meant to call out the best in the people. And that's, and that's, the, that's the constitutional soul. That's the form of the regime. But forms um, are um, a bummer. <laughs> and people um, resent them. And Harvey starts his essay, The Forms and Formalities of Liberty, with a quote, by Tocqueville that he's made famous, men living in democratic centuries do not readily understand the utility of forms. They feel an instinctive contempt for them, but they need them. They need them. The, the inconvenience that people and democracies find in forms also make those forms useful to liberty. Their principal merit, but presumably therefore not their only merit, being that they serve as a barrier between the strong and the weak, the governed um, and the governors. So democracy needs a form, but people resent it. They, they, they want to escape from the form. And a good constitution, just like a good dead show, gives people the possibility of escaping from their form. It gives them an executive who can act beyond form and outside form and against the form, who can just get the job done sometimes, who's not gonna have endless meetings and get bogged down by procedure and consult with every stakeholder before issuing, like our deans do, um, letters signed by 19 people. <laughs> the executive just does it. And the other thing that, that might take us out of the, of the constraint of forms is uh, our, our parties that are not part of the formal constitution. Parties, uh, you don't have to, you know, so you don't wear a coat and tie to the party. You, you, you can be yourself at the party. The wonderful thing, and, and political scientists are deploring it because they think it's destroying democracy, but, um, but the wonderful thing about parties is they, they're, they're the only social group um, that really give you permission to, um, to, to, to disdain and um, derogate the other social group. You're allowed to hate um, and speak badly of the other side. And, and part of the fun of gathering 
And now that you're a Democrat, Bill, part of you know, one of the, the, the funniest, you know, just taking the piss out of Republicans when you get together. And you get to do that. It's permitted. You can't do that, you know, about ethnic groups or racial groups or other social groups or even neighborhoods. But you can do that um, about parties and partisans. And, and that, that, that informality of um, affective partisanship, of getting to hate the other side, is so important. It's this, it's this moment when you can break out of the form and the formality and the good behavior. And, and, uh, and you know, learning too, of course, has a form, the classroom and the formality of teacher and student. Um, and, uh, and, 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 and yes, I make my students call me Professor Muirhead. What should we call you? We well, should call me Professor Muirhead. Um, and, uh, and, you know, uh, we're not friends yet. I'm your teacher. And, and, that, and that, you know, formality is, is the possibility of, of better behavior, of, of, of being a little bit more serious and, and, and acting like you're a little bit more thoughtful than, than you are. Um, but, but to really learn um, from each other, we have to also break out of that form and, um, and escape it and escape um, the conventions and the respectability in order to think thoughts that are so untimely, they almost can't be said. And, and you have to join teacher and student, friend and friend. And, uh, and I want to thank um, the Harv for <laughs> having offered us that as well. That was, that was Brian, your dream. <laughs> <laughs> or drum solo, if you want. Now, Russ said exactly what I was going to say. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, look, uh, if you know Harvey Mansfield's work, what I'm about to say is unnecessary. If you don't, it will be radically insufficient. But I come uh, with an offer, a guide one path through his work. I start with uh, Odysseus. This is from the Odyssey uh, by Homer. <laughs> Book 20, Odysseus has gotten to Ithaca but not yet challenged the suitors. He's uh, been checking things out. Odysseus lay down to sleep on the outer porch and there he lay sleepless, his mind racing with thoughts of how to punish the suitors. And then the women came from the house on their way as usual to sleep with the suitors, laughing with each other and giggling. Odysseus felt his chest tighten. He brooded for a long time over what he should do, rush out and kill every last one of them or let them sleep with the arrogant bastards this one last time. He growled under his breath the way a dog standing over her pups growls when she sees a stranger and digs in to fight. So Odysseus growled at their iniquity but he slapped his chest hard and scolded his heart. Endure, my heart. You endured worse than this on that day when the invincible Cyclops ate our comrades. You bore it until your cunning got you out of the cave where you thought you would die. And this way, Odysseus scolded his heart, and his heart in obedience beat steady and strong. So here we have Odysseus full of justified rage. Justified rage against the suitors who have taken what belongs to him, but restraining himself until he can reason through a plan of action which will bring his kingdom back to him, a plan that will not conquer his anger so much as channel it, put it to its best use. Justified rage, indignation, who can watch politics, domestic or international, for even a moment without noticing the importance of this feeling. Why does the modern science of politics not spend more time studying this feeling? The passage I've read is one of the only passages of poetry that Plato allows into the education of the guardians and the Republic. Socrates mentions and praises the passage at least twice, the second time to help prove that the soul is more complicated than merely reason and desire, that it also includes a third element, thumos, spirit. Socrates cites this passage about Odysseus to demonstrate two facts in particular, that thumos is a separate part of the soul from reason, 
And that while it cannot reason itself, it can listen to, follow reason. It can be tamed. I think both of these assertions, that there is a third part of the human psyche beyond reason and desire, and that this part can be tamed, have been central to Harvey Mansfield's work throughout his career. He began by thinking about parties and partisanship. His question was, how did parties become respectable? Factions, polarizations of opinion, or conspiracies, yes, to take power. How and why were they accepted as respectable parts of political life rather than dangerous disruptors of it? And he finds the answers in Edmund Burke and before him Machiavelli. Now, the greatest obstacle to making parties respectable in early modern times was the influence of religion. Partisanship contributed to the greatness of ancient Rome, Machiavelli suggests, but tore modern Florence apart. Why? In Florence, politics had been infiltrated by Christianity, so parties had become sects. In England, Burke called theologically justified parties the great parties and identified them as the ones that had to be diminished in the settlement of 1688 before parties could be integrated into the ordinary back and forth of politics. Now, Christianity might seem to be the opposite of thumatic anger. It aims to replace pride with humility, you could say. But, Mr. Mansfield noticed, when a Christian enters politics and claims authority on the basis of his religion, he seems to boast of having escaped pride, to demand public recognition, even rule for having done so, to assert the importance of that qualification. And in that assertion, we see the spiritedness in religion. So the settlement of 1688 was not only a muting of the religious question in politics, it was also a taming of thumos. A taming, but not a full escape from thumos. Party politics remains a sphere of assertion and competition, each side putting its own view forward as the whole. Party politics introduced, according to Harvey, by conservatives against the supposed inevitability of liberal progress is not all assertiveness, however. Party government also asks each side for some, often dim, recognition that there may be another legitimate point of view. There is this idea of legitimate opposition. And that's a self-consciousness that pure factionalism or civil war lacks. And that self-consciousness indicates the fact that Thumos can sometimes be tamed by something outside itself. Now, the most direct work on the taming of Thumos is the work on Machiavelli, which exploded the easy distinction between republics and principalities and the facile idea that there is some deep tension between the discourses on Livy and the prince by tracing carefully the role that princely figures play in republican politics and the ways that princes and aspiring princes make use of republican institutions, such as elections. The princely types are those with strong spirit. And Machiavelli's question is how they make their way in politics and how they devise systems for managing one another, often using the people as allies or pawns. Mr. Mansfield delights sometimes in the irreverent challenge posed by these figures and their violent self-assertions. And he makes a case for their necessity in politics, but also remains interested in how they are managed and tamed. Christianity appears in this context as a crafty strategy of self-assertion hiding itself beneath the cloak of piety. Machiavelli is shown to have admired and imitated this strategy, suggesting it be deployed in new guises against the Catholic Church itself. Mansfield traces a version of this strategy into the work of Thomas Hobbes, where he identifies what's been mentioned, a technique of indirect government. Hobbes obscured the question of who is ruling, and therefore the assertion involved in claiming rule behind a rhetoric of representation. Just as Christian priests and princes claim to rule in the name of some higher authority, Secular, secular leaders, too, could claim to rule in the name of others, in the name, for example, of the people. The most direct and obvious of Mansfield's books on taming spiritedness came with that verb in the title, Taming the Prince, a brilliant exploration of the roots of executive power. This was the Federalists' most original idea, an effort to put the dangerously independent and assertive power of a Machiavellian prince into the heart of a constitutional republic so as to remedy some of the weaknesses in republican government with the hope that constitutional forms could mitigate the danger this strategy introduces. Even more directly on topic was the book titled Manliness, 
which I will not be too timid to mention. A book that seemed to many, I think, a departure, but that I hope to have suggested was really an elaboration of a theme that had preoccupied Mansfield from early in his career. The book insisted that manly spiritedness exists, but argued also that it had to be tamed and that women, when they understood themselves as fundamentally complementary to men, had been better able to do this work of taming. I'll mention that Odysseus, immediately after the passage I read, turned to a goddess, Athena, for help. In 2007, Mansfield delivered a remarkable Jefferson lecture at the National Endowment for the Humanities, which hasn't yet been mentioned. It was titled, What the Humanities Have to Teach Political Science. Part of the answer was that literature understands something about human nature that science often ignores, the human resistance to learning something new. To overcome that resistance, literature entices and entertains. But that resistance, too, that we have is a form of self-assertion. And literature's wisdom about how to deal with it is another case of learning to harness and tame thumos. The deeper point was therefore that literature understands thumos better than science does. Literature sees the importance, he said, of proper names, that is, of individuals asserting their own unique importance. So that's why I began not with a theme or a model, but with a particular character, Odysseus. Let me close with the most relevant proper name, Harvey Mansfield. While I have focused on one way of trying to link together some of his intellectual contributions, it must be said that Harvey Mansfield himself demonstrates what Homer showed and Plato asserted, how spiritedness, a brave self-assertion in the name of justice, can be put in the service of reason. Thank you, Brian. Michael. The question I'd like to ask is whether Harvey is really a conservative. Mm -hmm. On the face of it, the answer is obviously. He's widely known as Harvard's most notorious conservative. But having been Harvey's colleague for 43 years, I'm not so sure. I would like to offer an esoteric reading <laughs> of Harvey's conservatism. In the Spirit of Liberalism, a collection of his essays published in 1978, Harvey claimed to offer a defense of liberalism by a friend of liberalism. And he acknowledged that, quote, when I call myself a friend of liberalism, as distinct from a liberal, I know that I come under suspicion of being an enemy of liberalism. But then consider in the same essay, Harvey's praise of modern conservatism. Modern conservatism was born, he writes, in rebellion against liberalism, but because of the conditions of its birth, it has settled into the comfortable relative status of liberalism's weak sister, nagging at the vices of its elder brother and at the same time absorbing fraternal hostility and serving as the butt of funny jokes. And then he writes this, it would be surprising if modern conservatism did not share some of the defects of present day liberalism. This makes me suspect that perhaps Harvey is a friend of conservatism as distinct from a conservative. For after all, what kind of conservative is he? Though he likes John Locke, is a kind of second best. Harvey is not a free market conservative. He does not love commercial society. Nor is he a religious conservative. Though Harvey is a friend of religion, he's not, by his own account, religious. 
Nor, despite his love of Plato and Aristotle, could Harvey be described exactly as a virtue or a soul craft, conservative. This became clear to me when Harvey and I jointly taught a course. We did it twice, along with George Will, a course on liberalism and conservatism in American politics. This was back for George in the days when he was a soulcraft conservative, statecraft as soulcraft. George and I, through the course of the semester, made, civic, made the civic Republican case against liberalism from our different angles. And in the student evaluations at the end of the course, there were some complaints. Students found it puzzling, they said, that of the three of us, the most robust defense of liberalism came from Harvey Mansfield. So what kind of conservative is he? Well, a first approximation would be to describe him as a thumos conservative. The central question in politics, he's written, is the contest for importance, for honor, for recognition, spiritedness, thumos. As Brian points out, that's what the manliness book is really about. On the surface, it's a complaint against the idea of a gender neutral society. But it's actually a book about thumos. It's a defense of thumos, and manliness is just a provocative name for it. And yet, it is not an unqualified defense of manliness, because, as Brian also pointed out, for Harvey, thumos is an incomplete virtue it gets carried away, and it needs always to be reined in by wisdom, by philosophy. So I would say that Harvey is a friend of manliness, which is to say a critic of it. Notice he doesn't claim the mantle of manliness for himself. He's too modest for that, too gentle. If you want a thoroughgoing instance, uh, exemplar of manliness, don't look to Harvey. Look to a figure such as Muhammad Ali, who said, I'm not the greatest, I'm the double greatest. <laughs> Not only do I knock him out, I pick the round. I'm the boldest, the prettiest, the most superior, the most scientific, <laughs> the most skillful fighter in the ring today. It's hard to be humble when you're as great as I am. <laughs> <laughs> That's not Harvey. <laughs> Muhammad Ali said that of himself, floats like a butterfly, stings like a bee. That's also not Harvey. Harvey floats like a butterfly and stings like a butterfly. <laughs> <laughs> I know this having debated him and taught with him on numerous occasions. Back uh, when we started that course, the three of us, that jointly taught course with George Will, I began, now I should add that Harvey says that thumos really is about, in part, it's about trading insults, which is how the course began. And so <laughs> my offering was, you may think that it's unfair, this course, liberalism and conservative, two against one. George Will and Harvey against me. But I said, I've heard Professor Mansfield, when it comes to modern political science, there, Harvey is a scathing, a scathing critic. 
I remember hearing him years ago introduce our colleague James Q. Wilson at the American Political Science Association when Jim was being given a, a big award. Harvey introduced him and celebrated his career. And he concluded his introduction of James Q. Wilson by saying, and when not keeping up with the profession, he likes to read a good book. <laughs> <laughs> that, that is stinging like a bee. <laughs> Though I must say, the sting was missed by most of the political scientists <laughs> sitting there. I got it. So Harvey is fierce in his critique of po modern political science because it misses thumos. It focuses instead on self-interest. And as Harvey points out, people go into politics to pick a fight, not to avoid one. And self-interest, and this is really what Harvey takes to be the defect of modern political science, a preoccupation with self-interest as a way of understanding politics misses the soul. Apparently, Harvey writes, apparently, and this is what makes us, it's this capacity for thumos that also makes us capable of shame. Apparently, you have a self above yourself that's sometimes critical of yourself and makes you ashamed. Let's call that a soul, Harvey writes. Soulful people are complicated by virtue of holding themselves at a certain distance from themselves. But aren't we all like this, more or less? Soulful people hold themselves at a certain distance from themselves. That's Harvey. He loves thumos and manliness, but he does not partake of it to excess. This is the source of his modesty and also of his wit. And it's also the source of his greatness as a teacher. Soulful people holding oneself at a certain distance from oneself. It's this stance that makes room for students. And so on my esoteric reading of Harvey's conservatism, I would conclude by saying that Harvey is not exactly a conservative. He's a friend of conservatism, or perhaps more precisely, a wry acquaintance of it. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, uh, Michael. I, uh, Questions on a wide variety of topics, you know, Muhammad Ali, Odysseus, mm -hmm. manliness, the Grateful Dead, the usual political science kind of, yeah, yeah, VOK, if you want to hear. <laughs> <laughs> time for a couple of comments or questions, brief. Here's, yeah. Words, yeah. Um, Harvey, the occasion is unique. I can't miss this. I've been meaning to ask you a simple question <laughs> since so many years. Now it's the time. Are you prepared to denounce, repudiate, reject the idea that Machiavelli was <laughs> a teacher of evil? <laughs> yeah, well, that's... <laughs> he thought that teaching evil was a pretty good thing. <laughs> uh, 
We could get through a lot of Q and A's if they're this. If we, if we keep going at this pace, <laughs> but very revealing ones. <laughs> there was another question here. And up I'm there in sure. the back too, a student. Yeah. yeah. We've got a student, yeah. younger person. Thank you very much. Uh, my name is Jacob Kramers. I'm a senior at the college. Um, Professor Mansfield mentioned in his comments today, uh, for today, that his gods are higher in the sky than conservatism. And I'm wondering if the panel could perhaps comment further on uh, what conservatism is in their view and whether Professor Mansfield is a conservative. I think there's one person who can answer that yeah. question, <laughs> and he's over there. <laughs> Yeah. yeah, the sooner we get Harvey up here, maybe I should just, you know, yeah, we should Harvey, all just step on, aside and <laughs> you can now take questions for 15, 20 minutes. That would actually be, well, let's take one or two more questions for this esteemed panel and then we'll give, give Ray to Harvey if that's okay. Um, I feel like no one wants to talk to, no one wants to talk to Russ about the Grateful Dead. I mean, well, Bill, uh, uh, you know, I didn't I, know all that stuff. Like, yeah, that was, I learned so just, much today. Right? <laughs> um, I mean, as someone who has been a conservative, um, I, I am curious about your take on on Michael's esoteric reading and on the and on the question. Uh, no, I'm very sympathetic to Michael's esoteric reading because, and it's not that esoteric to be honest. Because <laughs> no, because in fact, I mean, sort of obviously, conservatism has been in the past a house of many mansions, and if there are only two political parties or two main sets of schools. One has to sort of find, well, this doesn't have to, but it's sometimes convenient to find one's home more or less in one than the other. So on the one hand, uh, it's not that every intelligent person, honestly, is not entirely comfortable with either, with every aspect of either school, every doctrine, every dogma that's sort of accreted over the years and decades and centuries. Many of them, of course, are self-contradictory or in con conflict with one another, famously, uh, not among conservatives, free market, and religious conservatives, let's say, but some are true on the left as well, obviously, and as you well know, communitarian and individualist liberalism. And so I, I think uh, Michael, I, I'm sympathetic to Michael's argument, yeah. But that was a good way of dodging the Grateful Dead, Russ. So that's good. <laughs> are the Russell, uh, the Grateful Dead esoteric conservatives? Yeah, I, yes, actually. <laughs> yes. <laughs> exactly, no, exactly. Right. Yeah, that's the thing, it's the, it's the form in what purports to be anti-form. And it's a very conservative enterprise. I mean, I think Tom Wolfe understood that. Could I just say, in the United States, conservatism has always been connected with respect for constitution, the constitution, constitutional institutions. And that clearly is something that is central to Harvey's teaching. But of course, the current Republican Party um, is does not seem to have that same respect um, in practice, although they might rhetorically. Um, so that shows the difficulties of being a member of a allegedly conservative party when they lose that fundamental connection. But even that's a slightly sanitized version of American conservatism, because in fact, in the real world, as you know very well, of American conservatism and its history, it's from George, going backwards, George Will said it was a ill-founded founding, let me say, you know, from a conservative point of view, the founders were too much believers in progress and institutions and not enough virtue. And obviously actual real American conservatives have had many criticisms, as you well know, of the founders and, uh, and of the constitution itself. Um, so, and the one real assault on the constitution, after all, in actual American history, came, this is over something that came from the right more than from the left, you know, <laughs> so, um, uh, so to speak, in the Civil War. So, yeah, I, I think, but I think you're right. I mean, modern, the healthy part of modern conservatism was an attempt to remind people of the importance of the Constitution and the underlying understandings that informed the Constitution against the kind of progressivism that wanted to leave it behind pretty explicitly in many cases in the 50s and 60s. And so I think that is a very, in that respect, Harvey is a, a yes, very much of a, uh, conservative, America's constitutional soul. Yeah. Thank you. I have a question uh, uh, for the panelists on the here and now. It just struck me that he who has accused, um, from my view, the guest, the distinguished guest on the far left uh, of running a half failing newspaper or a failing newspaper, depending on you know how we read it, uh, it the, the word that we usually, the sin that we usually attribute to that person uh, is uh, the same word that has just appeared 
uh, in, in the Critique of Meritocracy, authored by, uh, again, from my view on the far right of the panel, uh, Hubris. Uh, so it's, uh, I, I have a question about uh, hubris and thumos. Uh, how can we, uh, in our present uh, impasse, uh, both leverage and harvest thumos to reanimate our politics, but at the same time also tame uh, the hubristic uh, part of um, the, uh, the, the, the cult of um, uh, tyrannical politics. So how can we uh, both use thumos and tame hubris? So not only for uh, the two guests I mentioned, but for any panelist who uh, can offer us some prescription um, or caution. Very good question. Brian, you want to, you, you, you want to address that? You, you were, uh, you were, you were a qualified defender of the loss there. So yeah, that is. Well, uh, with Tocqueville and Harvey's Tocqueville in mind, I would say that one of the challenges comes from democracy itself, which tends to un untame uh, in many ways. So political theory that thinks of itself as democratic theory can find it hard to confront this problem. And so I would point to the, to my uh, predecessor on the panel, to his remarks. That is the importance of, of constitutional forms. And is Thumas always connected to inequality? That seems to be what you're implying when you say that democracy has a particular problem with it. Because in some sense, wouldn't a conservative aristocracy that also have a problem with thumatic types showing up and seeking to overturn these ridiculous old forms. Yes, but isn't there a kind of in, in, intensely anti-formal quality to democratic life that, you know, we want to wear shorts and I show up without a tie and uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's the argument. Michael? Well, I, w I would say that the, if we think of the hubristic, the exemplary hubristic figures of our day, the, um, the tech billionaires from Silicon Valley, what's striking about them is that their hubris isn't, isn't classical thumos. It's, if anything, a corrupt and hollow um, residuum of the thematic impulse. And the test of this is that, that someone who has genuine thumos, going back to Homer's account of it, wants to live in memory, wants immortality. But that's not what these guys want. What they want is to live forever, which is why they're investing billions in life extension, which should be a tip off that their, uh, their hubris doesn't draw on genuine thumos. Um, it, it draws it best on a kind of debased um, uh, version of it which would substitute eternity for immortality. If I can follow up on that, Michael, um, the, what, what I might say is that, I don't know about you know, Thumos, but I think what we, what we need in American politics is, is in a way more ambition and the kind of ambition that the Constitution invites. Um, a couple of our colleagues here in the government department, um, Danny and, and Ziblatt and, and, and uh, and, and Steve Levitsky have uh, recently, you know, publicized their criticism of the U.S. Constitution for being anti-majoritarian, um, especially the U.S. Senate and the Electoral College. And uh, see, what's been happening my whole life is that neither party has been able to form a constitutional majority, a durable majority that can win the House, the Senate, and the presidency. I mean, over time, the last you know, person to do that was, uh, was Franklin Roosevelt. Um, and, and so th in fact, what the, 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 the constitution is emphatically majoritarian. It just requests that, that leaders put a majority together of a certain type. 
It has to be very numerous, not just barely over 50%. It has to be geographically dispersed. It has to last over time. Only a third of the Senate is up for re-election in any given you know, national election. And so durable, numerous, dispersed. And if you can do that, guess what you can do? You can rule with a capital R, with Thumos. You can rule. And, and, and in, you can rule so profoundly, so thoroughly, that it's almost like you can refound the regime. And, and the greatest leaders in American history have done that. They're Jefferson. He did that first. He ruled and he ruled after he stopped being president and even after he died. And then Martin Van Buren behind the scenes, Jackson in front of the scenes creates what we say the age of Jackson. It wasn't just two terms. And then Lincoln. Lincoln does this. And, 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 and then finally Franklin Roosevelt. And since 1968, no one's been able to do it. But what I lament is that no one has tried. Hmm. Russ is revealing, however, his historic democratic roots. I'll now reveal my not so democratic Hamilton you left out, who in fact is his regime, you know? And he did it without becoming president. And he did it by being unpopular uh, to some degree throughout his tenure in office. And then of course, disgraced almost at the end and then dies still quite a young man in that in a duel. And that, I've, I've always found Hamilton's ambition and the success of the Hamiltonian project, which Jefferson had to yield to in many important ways, right? Obviously, and, and, and Lincoln then all honors to Jefferson, but the reason he gives that, writes that wonderful letter in 1859 is that Lincoln, of course, was a Whig and sort of descended from the Hamiltonians and has to sort of reach out to the Jeffersonians prior to the Civil War to try to form a, a common coalition against, against the uh, secessionists. So I just want to add Hamilton to, to your litany of successfully I ambitious that. Americans. Plus I'm in tune, so to speak, with the spirit of the age, since it's very we're in a, we're weirdly in a pro, I mean, I came, I'm, I'm old enough to remember when Hamilton was unpopular with sort of the mainstream, but still sort of a representative of the wealthy and so forth, and too anti-majoritarian, too anti-democratic. And then we have a wonderful musical about him that does give me hope for the future in the midst of everything else, you know? So, uh, Paul Peterson, and then we'll let Harvey, maybe, maybe I think, take the floor. We'll wait for the microphone. Uh, uh, there's more spirit in uh, the contemporary conversation than has been suggested. I think both sides of the political aisle have expressed a spirited attempt to impose a permanent majority and if they can succeed, they, would, they could really change the nature of the Constitution. And, um, but their strategies are quite different. Uh, on the, uh, from the left, the idea is to change the institutions. Uh, and the critical institutions are you've got to break down uh, the bipartisan character of the Senate, which you can do that by getting rid of the filibuster and uh, through, you know, uh, you just have to have a few more votes and, and you can get there. Uh, and by uh, weakening the power of the Supreme Court by adding new justices. What you can do once you will have a majority in the two houses of Congress, even for a short period of time, you don't need it for an extended period of time. You just have to have a moment in time and you, by through some adjustment, oh, and also COVID is extremely important in this regard because by changing the election rules so that um, you change uh, when people vote and how they vote, you destroy the Australian ballot. All of these are techniques that the most sophisticated part of our society has thought about as a means of a, obtaining a permanent and majority, one that can actually, you know, stop the globe from warming as a possibility out there that if you could possibly capture majority over the long run, you could, you could attain that goal and you could create a better world. Uh, so there's a utopian view there and it's, uh, and there's a, and there's a strategy defined. And against that, you have a working class, a rural, the pitchfork people, right? The pitchfork people led by their uh, tyrant, 
who is uh, the voice against that uh, and, and, and says all of these strategies are out there, they're illegitimate, they're against the Constitution, they're against our system. As an extremely spirited contest that's sort of like parties uh, want to hate each other. Is that, I forgot which of you said that, but yeah, so they have developed a genuine deep capacity to hate that they didn't have maybe in the 1950s. Um, so I think we got to give them credit. <laughs> Thank you, Paul. Why don't we, look, I'll just go down the line, just final remarks, and then we'll let Harvey speak. Is that okay? Yeah. Michael, you want to say oh, something no, first? No? Anyone else? Ahead. No? Okay. That was Harvey? Do you want to sit, stand? Sit. All right. Um, um, I, could, I could begin by addressing the question about conservatism. Uh, why do I say that uh, my gods <coughs> live higher in the, in the universe than conservatism? Uh, you know, conservatism is an attack on or no opposition to liberalism. So um, isn't there something necessarily uh, partial about that? Uh, that sounds reasonable to suppose that the other side has its points and that the truth would lie in some kind of combination of conservatism and liberalism, and that would be higher in the sky <laughs> and perhaps um, only uh, realizable uh, in thought, but, but still um, mm, acting as a kind of guide, but also as a kind of uh, limit on uh, the conservatism that we see and that is practiced. But I want to end with um, a couple of sayings, or uh, dicta. <laughs> um, one is, uh, I, one I, I often use and the other is not. Uh, the one I often use goes like this. Um, I went to high school, the last two years of high school in Columbus, Ohio. Um, and my father was a, a professor. He was the chairman of the political science department at Ohio State University. And um, so I used to go to the football games, became a great Buckeye fan and that, uh, continued to this very day. I saw them beat Notre Dame two weeks ago. <laughs> um, and and um, as the chair of the department, uh, chairman in those days, uh, he uh, invited a lot of faculty to come over. And I heard, kid as I was, we're talking about 1948, 49. Um, it jokes or jests that uh, professors like to make. And here's the one question. How many students are there at Ohio State? Answer, about one in a hundred. <laughs> <laughs> now Ohio State at, even then was very big and it calls itself the Ohio State University because it's the only state university in Ohio. And other foolish states like Michigan divide themselves from Michigan and Michigan State, Kansas and Kansas State, Iowa and Iowa State, and so on. Whereas um, the Buckeyes, <laughs> they were about 50,000 strong in those days. And this uh, jest, I can't call it a joke really, but um, those 50,000 are really not all students because a student is somebody who studies. <laughs> uh, and those are only about one in a hundred. That means that uh, they really only have 500 students, not 50,000. So don't strut around. <laughs> as the Ohio State University, a big time. Anyway, so... Uh, so but the, but this you, is really yeah. our case, Harvey, about how empirical political science is parasitic on normative evaluation. 
you're uh, stating my point before I get. Oh, I'm so sorry. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that uh, <laughs> right. What that what this one in a hundred means is that um, a thing can be defined, and perhaps it's best defined in its best example. What it is being a student at its most complete, its most perfect. So I try to use that to guide my, and I recommend it to others, to guide their political science. The trouble with a lot of our political science is that it's too much concerned with the 50,000 and not with the 500. If you are always counting things, the results you get are always average. Average. <laughs> An average, too, that swallows up the best so that the 50,000 or the 49,500 <laughs> um, swallow up and forget and leave out of account the best, the greatest. Uh, so political science should take its guide, perhaps, at least from a consideration of the greatest. And perhaps it might be better to use it as a beginning point so that you define it according to what is lacking in the 50,000. You can take the word uh, student and replace it with voter. <clears throat> And that would give you a, an impression of democracy. Winston Churchill, this is the second saying, um, you probably heard this story, but I'll tell it anyway. Um, he was visiting a, a noble family uh, the next weekend. And the butler from that family called up Churchill or Churchill's house, expecting to hear Churchill's butler. And he asked him what uh, Mr. Churchill's preferences were in various things. And Churchill, pretending to be his own butler said, Mr. Churchill is always easily satisfied with the very best. <laughs> That's the spirit I want to leave with you. And thank you for this wonderful occasion.